Microphones and headphones provided by Audio Technica. To learn more, head over to audiotechnica.com. The views expressed on this episode of My Take Radio do not reflect the views, thoughts, or feelings of the My Take Radio staff, My Take Radio advertisers, or My Take Radio content partners. Listener and viewer discretion is advised. This coverage is live and uncensored, so if you have any small children present, you may want to have them leave the room. Hey, what's up, guys? My Take Radio, episode 266 for Thursday, January 15th, 2015. I'm your host, Rich, and our caller number is 347-324-3541. Again, that number is 347-324-3541. You can listen, watch, and chat live by heading over to mtrlive.com, gfqlive.tv, or you can use the Mixler app, and listen to the show that way. Archived episodes of the show are available on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, and video versions will be available on YouTube and on RageWorks.net. All right, so yesterday, well, I kind of want to say a a couple of hours ago, um, we wrapped up a really good MMA and wrestling episode of My Take Radio, and as such, you know, we went in the lab and started working on a couple of things, and we noticed, which is, you know, pretty pretty damn awesome that a lot of you guys have been down downloading the shows via mobile and listening to the shows via mobile so i definitely want to know from you guys how that experience is i know that i've been seeing a lot of people using the mixler app primarily on ios but also on android and if you guys are using that to hear the live versions of the show i definitely would love to hear your feedback because i think that um You know, it's one of those things where we got to definitely try and raise our mobile footprint. And over the last couple of months, I've noticed that a lot of people are consuming a lot more podcasts than they did uh, two or three years ago. I think just because the medium and the terminology itself is so mainstream, um, it's very easy nowadays to tell people about a podcast or an Internet broadcast and they get it right away. It's not like in the old days. I'd like to say three, four years ago where you had to explain it. And give people the semantics as to how you got on the radio, how the radio got on the internet, et cetera, et cetera. People pretty much just get it and it works. Um, you know, it's um, one of those things where we're definitely trying to get all of our bases covered. I mean, we've been getting a lot more people listening via Stitcher and tune in radio, which is great. Um, hopefully, if all works well, there's going to be another outlet which um, hopefully if we become a part of it will be a pretty big deal. So um, I'm keeping that one under my hat. But if I hear something, I'll definitely make sure to share it with you guys. Mortis, I just read that and it was horrifying. (laughs) But thank you. Um, In any event, definitely, like I said, I want to hear from you guys with regards to how you're listening to the shows. I know some people are fans of just letting it play via YouTube and accessing it via Uh, You know, Xbox Live, which you can watch the shows there. You can also watch them on the PlayStation Network using the browser. And that's just another way that you guys can do it. Um, One thing that a lot of people have been talking to me about is the possibility of doing a My Take Radio Roku app and putting the show on Roku. And um, I've been exploring that. And hopefully once I get a little bit more information 
and I get to the bottom of how you get that done and what particular parts of the site and of the show we can put on there, then of course we will share that with you guys. But um, in an effort to keep things um, pretty much duplicated from show to show, I did want to give you guys some updates with regards to MyTakeRadio.com and the current direction and what's going to happen with MyTakeRadio.com and with regards to RageWorks.net. So a couple of things, and I've been talking about this at length, but I know some guys may have missed a show here or there, so I'll put this out again. Uh, By the end of the month, by January 31st, uh, the goal is to roll MyTakeRadio.com into RageWorks.net for two reasons. Number one, just maintaining two sites is an incredibly arduous task, especially when it comes to editing audio and video. Uh, By doing it this way, you know, RageWorks is the parent company of MyTakeRadio. As such, all properties and and projects will be under the RageWorks umbrella, including my take radio and a couple of other projects that I'm working on. So with that, I feel that RageWorks should be the hub for everything. Again, that's not changing anything with regards to the show. It's just changing where you're going to be able to listen to it. Uh, with that, of course, my take radio.com will be forwarding to RageWorks.net shortly after January 31st. And in addition to that, we will also be forwarding mtrlive.com to a live listening page on RageWorks. So the chat room, uh, all the different players, everything will be on RageWorks and you guys will be able to access the show there with minimal issues, if any, whatsoever. So that's pretty much where we're going with that. Now, with regards to our social media accounts, the Facebook fan page for My Take Radio will remain active, as will our Twitter account, YouTube channel, etc., the only things that we did get rid of was our Twitch channel. We now have a RageWorks TV channel, which we're going to hopefully be streaming to in the coming weeks. In addition to that, we're also going to start doing more streaming on Daily Motion as well, since they now have a video a video game portal as well. We're going to try and get more streaming up there uh, myself, and I'm going to try and get some get some streaming done with Slick as well, and even Quark and Blade if the opportunity presents itself so be on the lookout for that uh, with regards to content on rageworks.net of course we got a brand new lucha underground recap on deck courtesy of lucha lee we also got some stuff coming from mortis uh well correction from slick uh lucha lee and mortis are the same person uh there you go i kind of spoiled the uh, superman clark kent uh alter ego for lucha lee but in any case uh he is our resident recapper for lucha underground so he will be posting that recap within the next day or so uh slick has a ton of stuff out including a lot of dying light stuff if you're really interested in that game i recommend you guys check it out i have some product reviews on deck which you guys should be seeing this weekend along with some other uh little nuggets of information that we're going to be putting on the site don't want to spoil too much but you guys will see what happens over the weekend and hopefully you guys will like where we go with that Uh, One thing I do want to say, and I talked about this last week, and I'm going to mention it again, uh, the probability of the return of our forums is looking more and more possible, primarily because Facebook is just a merciless, merciless mistress with regards to ensuring that you guys get all our updates. And I know a lot of you guys don't like to make the jump to Twitter or Google+. You guys are pretty comfortable within the confines of Facebook. So with that, we are definitely really strongly uh, giving consideration to bringing the forums back. If so, I really would like to hear from you guys, uh, you know, what you would expect from the forum, what kind of an outlet you'd prefer. As always, I know that I can count on Slick to uh, deliver the ban hammer as needed, but also moderate it effectively as always. And of course, the rest of the Rageworks team will be involved if we launch a forum as usual. If you guys remember... Uh, The original My Take Radio forums were pretty good. They started off rather aggressively, but like anything else with forums, they taper off unless you're constantly monitoring them, babying them, and creating content for them. And once that becomes a bigger project than managing the show and the site, then, you know, sometimes we got to pull the plug. As always, if you guys have suggestions, ideas, I am definitely open to them. And as all, and you know, my door is always open. You guys are welcome to reach out via social media. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever medium you choose, share your thoughts and we'll take it into consideration and try to give you guys the best experience possible. 
All right, so we got on deck tonight a ton of gaming news. We got some decent movie news this week. There's also a lot of Marvel and DC film stuff that I want to get into, and um, hopefully that stuff will answer a couple of questions you guys had and hopefully shed some light on certain news stories. But before I get into that stuff, I did want to talk about, and this is something that um, with the post-CES now, uh, you know, the next couple of months, we're seeing a lot of stuff getting the discount, getting the boot. And um, I actually want to talk about a service that I found out is being, the support for it is being discontinued, and that is Google TV. For those of you that know me well, you know that I've you've been a Google TV user pretty much since inception. And um, from the Logitech review box all the way to the Sony Google TV box, I truly felt that the medium itself had a ton of potential, but I always felt that Google did not support it adequately. And sure enough, uh, right after CES, it was officially confirmed that Google was dropping their support for Google TV, which uh, considering that Chromecast is so successful and Roku and Apple TV and countless other set top boxes, I'm not shocked. Of course, within that same breath that they announced the discontinuation of support for Google TV, Android TV started becoming the latest buzzword. Now, the reason I want to mention this um, is because a lot of times, a lot of, you know, a lot of my friends, they ask why I don't make the jump to digital, meaning, you know, digital downloads, digital games, kind of stepping away from physical mediums. And a lot of the time I say that when a service or a provider goes down, all that money you've invested into it goes down the toilet. Now, that's not to say that the Google TV box has not been a great investment. On the contrary, you've got a full functioning Chrome browser, which allows me to watch uh, countless shows and podcasts right directly from the browser. Of course, I have Netflix and a host of other services as well. Plus, it has probably one of the best mobile keyboards I've ever seen. Uh, but the only thing is that you can see that the, the support was waning. And when you have a $35 a HDMI dongle that pretty much provides the same thing, it, it's a no brainer as to why people would want to part with $100, $150 or more to get the same experience when you can get it from a device that's pretty much the size of a USB flash drive. Now, the thing that gets me as, you know, just somebody who's invested in an ecosystem like this is that I didn't invest a lot of money with regards to applications, but I did invest a decent amount of money for hardware, you know, and even if I bought it when it first came out, I remember my Logitech review box cost me $199 at the time. It had a full QWERTY keyboard, and I mean a full keyboard, like not some tiny rinky dink mobile keyboard, but like a full on crack somebody over the head style keyboard. And when Sony threw their hat in the ring and they launched their Google TV set top box, it was a really great remote with uh, touch and voice activation and a full functioning QWERTY keyboard with a footprint no bigger than a Samsung Note 4. Pretty much the remote is the same size. And like I said, I really put my support behind it because again, Google is an open platform. People were developing all kinds of badass apps, really cool stuff. And like everything else, you kind of get bit in the ass. So um, I wanted to share that with you guys because again, my my desire to jump, you know, to move away from uh, physical media is not something that's going to happen for the foreseeable future. On the contrary, as long as I can continue to buy tangible games and tangible movies, I will continue to do so. Because like I said, there's not one unified platform out there that, you know, that's 100 percent certain, not to mention 100 percent foolproof. And yeah, it's easy to say that Apple and iTunes will, you know, will be around forever. But nothing is forever. I mean, I just, you know, in that same breath that I say that I read an article that Radio Shack is, within the next month is going to file for bankruptcy. Uh, when, I, when we were growing up, Radio Shack was one of the few places that we could wander in when our parents didn't want to deal with us and we could play with remote control cars and all kinds of cool little gadgets. Plus, if you were somebody like me that likes to tinker and, and create things and build things and and mess around with wiring and all kinds of stuff. You knew that Radio Shack was a safe haven for you, but obviously that is no longer the case. So as as all these mediums evolve, you know, you're kind of forced to to pick a side, so to speak. And in in my 
you know, in in my opinion, the way I see it is I will I'll continue to support physical media. I will, you know, definitely venture into digital media where necessary. Obviously, with Xbox Live and PlayStation Plus, I have a fair amount of digital games. But again, I just I still like being able to hold a DVD or a Blu-ray uh, CDs. Not so much because in, in, in that regard, that becomes very cumbersome considering that I keep the bulk of my music on a server. But with movies, it's a little different because, you know, I like lending a Blu-ray out to, to a friend or, you know, I like taking a Blu-ray someplace and throwing it in and we all sit down and watch it. And, um, you know, it's just one of those things where for the time being, I'm pretty happy with the medium where it is. Uh, one thing that I did notice was the discussion of 4K Blu-rays, which which I said, you know, when Slick and I discussed it before, if 4K TVs are nowhere near uh, complete insertion, I wouldn't worry too much about 4K Blu-rays. Um, <clears throat> I kind of see uh, some some vitriol in the in the chat room. Uh, first thing Slick said with regards to Google TV, he said, sucks for those people that bought that LG TV where the remote is a Google TV keyboard. This is true. And you could peel the... T <laughs> um, Slick also adds, fuck Radio Shack and Dark Helmet. Uh, throws in there, fuck Radio Whack. Um, I, I didn't realize that the hate for Radio Shack was on that level. I mean, don't get me wrong, they were never the cheapest place to go. Um, but the you know you're you're still you were still able to go in there and pick up the occasional funky looking wire. Or in my sister's case, when she had the NES, uh, you know that the AC adapter on the NES was notorious for for shorting out and breaking. So you are always able to go into Radio Shack and pick a uh, uh, pick a universal, um, you know, a universal plug that would fit your Nintendo Genesis and Super Nintendo. I, I, I spent many a time in a Radio Shack buying plugs for all of those consoles, first for me and later on for for my sister as I pass some of that stuff down. So, you know, like I said, it's um it's nostalgic and it's it's it, it's it's a little sad just because think about it. We've watched so many different companies come and go i mean it, it slick knows as a new yorker one retailer that everybody was always checking out was the whiz if every if anybody remembers nobody beats the whiz had that really terrible slogan but they had a really really a really cool assortment of stuff i remember one of the last home theaters i bought years ago um you know, for my mom was from Nobody Beats the Wiz. As a matter of fact, it was on Main Street in Flushing here in uh, in New York City in Queens. And, um, you know, stores like that, you talk about the Wiz, Cra Slick mentions Crazy Eddie. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I got to throw out there, even Circuit City. Circuit City had its moments where it was complete dog shit. But even still, at least you had alternatives at the time. I remember when Circuit City was finally going out of business, I racked up buying accessories for my consoles um you know dvds all over the place i ended up buying a dvd recorder um which actually transferred from vhs to dvd from panasonic which had a book value of 550 dollars and for some reason they accidentally took it out of the box at circuit city and somebody sold it to me for 125 bucks and that's the kind of stuff that would happen in stores like that. You know, you were able to go in there and kind of haggle and negotiate. And we don't have that anymore. You know, it's either Best Buy or PC Richard. And that's pretty much it. I think PC Richard is probably the last, like, big box independent retailer outside of something like Best Buy. Or, you know, Fry's Electronics, where which Brian mentioned. Um, you know, Fry, Fry's is a... I've never had the uh, the opportunity to check out a Fry's Electronics, but people always say good things about it. I mean, nowadays between Amazon and Monoprice and, you know, all these other stores, fuck, even Groupon. I got an email from Groupon to buy a 4K TV and, um, uh, you know, it was a Vizio 4K capable TV for like nine for like nine eighty nine. Uh, it had a retail value of fourteen hundred. And it's just it's just crazy, like I said, and. I am showing my age a little bit, but I did want to share that with you guys because, you know, seeing, seeing, like I said, companies like Radio Shack, The Wiz, all those companies going under, it's while to some degree, it's the death of big box retailers to another degree, it's, it's eliminating places where you could go and play with stuff, you know, like 
you go to Best Buy, you walk around, you sit in the home theater chairs, you look at the 4K TVs that you may never buy yourself. Um, you wander into Magnolia and play with curved LG TVs that are po probably showing the Avengers. You know, that, that experience is slowly but surely dwindling. And, you know, as nostalgic as it sounds, it's still something that nobody gets to do anymore. Yeah, you can go to Amazon and buy the, 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 uh, the cheapest TV possible, but you're not getting that same experience of going into a store and walking around all the aisles and messing around with all the stuff. I mean, you know, that's... That's one of the few things that even with um, with Best Buy, for, for as much as Best Buy has its shitty experiences, you know, you're still able to go in there and wander over to a Wii U kiosk and play a spirited game of Mario Kart for 20 minutes. You know, it's, 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 it's insane. And for me, being in my 30s, I've seen, you know, the rise of a lot of these stores. Like I said, Nobody Beats the Wiz, Crazy Eddie, uh, Sixth Avenue Electronics. And just like they've risen, I've seen them fall. And I know a lot of guys that are older than me are going to talk about, you know, stores like Woolworth and Caldor and uh, Alexander's, Lionel Kitty City, uh, you know, big box stores that were big when I was a kid and they were growing up. But, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things where, yes, it's easy to wake up and sit in front of your computer and, you know, buy a movie and not have to deal with walking into a store and, and you know, driving to the store and dealing with the crowds. But sometimes you you want that and you need that because... You, that's how that's how you end up finding out stuff, uh, building relationships. You, you'd be surprised. I mean, even now, I wander into the Sony Style Store. I know a lot of the guys in there. Um, a couple of them listen to the show, and it's always a cool experience. They shoot the shit with me. I mean, just because I don't like the policies in the Sony Style Store doesn't mean that, you know, it's not a cool place to wander into and play with all the stuff. Uh, same thing with um, the Microsoft Store. It's like, yeah, it's a specialty store, but you can go in there, mess around with all the laptops, play on the giant 125 foot tv etc etc you know those experiences for for as shitty as they may be they do have their place anyway that's enough of uh, about me showing my age and taking a trip down memory lane uh let's get into some of the gaming news for the week uh there's quite a bit to discuss and um i'm not trying to go into the into the two hour show because i was pretty close to an hour and 45 minutes yesterday, so let's get that ball rolling and talk games, shall we? All right, so first thing I want to discuss is the soon-to-be-released Ultra Street Fighter 4 on PlayStation 4. Of course, one of the things with regards to that game that so many people are looking forward to is obviously the conversion of graphics from the PlayStation 3 to the PlayStation 4. I honestly feel that at this point, uh, like Slick just said, it's pretty much quadruple, quintuple dipping at this point. But I, you know, for as much as um, for as much as I love Street Fighter, I know I'll probably pick it up <laughs> like an asshole. Uh, but the way I see it is that for those of you that are looking forward to playing Street Fighter on the PlayStation 4. Uh, let me give you guys a rundown of what you're getting. Um, of course, you're going to get all the costumes, all the vacation and animal costumes that have been released thus far are being released with the game. You're also going to get Omega Mode and of all the new characters, all the stages are all going to be available for the game when it drops this spring. Right now, there has not been a price yet, but I'm leaning towards probably $49.99. I know a lot of people are, are expecting the game to be at... Oh, I just heard a call drop. Let's see where it was. Oh, of course it was on the blog talk radio side. Hold on a second. Uh, and there it goes. Hold on a second, guys. Welcome to Blog Talk Radio. Please enter your host pin. When finished, press the pound key. To start your show now, press 1. Since it appears you're calling back into a live show, we are reconnecting you now. Oh, gee, thanks so much for reconnecting me. Thank you so much. Anyway, as I was saying, um, you know the funny thing, before I even continue my thought, last night when I did the show, 
a big banner was on the top of my switchboard that said, Blog Talk Radio has been experiencing technical difficulties and your call may drop during your show. And yesterday the show ran smooth. Today, that everything is quote unquote fixed, of course it shits the bed. Anyway, as I was saying, you know, Ultra Street Fighter 4, the expectation is that you're going to be paying $59.99 for the game. But um, the thing that gets me is that they're probably not going to do $59.99 because like Slick just said, there's a lot of, you know, quadruple, quintuple dipping, and people are going to be slightly soured on it. Of course, those that have made the transi transition to PlayStation 4 at this point and no longer own a PlayStation 3 are going to be perfectly comfortable with it. But for the rest of us that are multi-console owners, you're going to be a little bent out of shape having to lay out 60 bucks for a game. But, I'm you know, the rumblings I'm hearing are between $39.99 and $49.99, and at this case, you know, what I'd probably do is I'd probably sell my Ultra Street Fighter 4 on my Xbox 360 and more than likely I'd probably pick up um I'd pick it up for the PlayStation 4 one because I'm a, I'm a Street Fighter fanatic and because I'm just a glutton for punishment, but in any case like I said, if you are interested in picking up the game, you will get the vacation costumes, the wild costumes and the Omega mode as well along with the quote unquote graphic improvements. We'll see how that goes. Now, it's not every day that we talk, we get into some what the fuck gaming news, but um, I do got to say that this bit of news really, really surprised me, as was the source where it came from. Uh, first, it was actually talked about on uh, bloodydisgusting.com, and then it was mentioned on EGM, and that is that there is going to be a brand new Friday the 13th game um, being released for consoles, multiple platforms in October and the crazy thing is that you're going to be able to play similar to how Alien Isolation plays in the sense that you're either you can play as Jason but you can also play as somebody running from Jason which is pretty fucking cool if you ask me the last time that I, I had any remote care or remote care or concern for Friday the 13th was playing it on the NES and Jason was fucking purple <laughs> you know it's it's one of those things where you know, it, that's a nostalgic game in every sense of the word, playing Jason on the NES and wandering from cabin to cabin with, you know, the, 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 one, the one player whose hair always looked like it was perpetually in one direction and jumping and throwing rocks at random people and um, hoping that you can get the, the, the super weapon to fight Jason at X house. Um, you know, it, I like, I like where the concept is going and, um, what, like I said, they're describing it as an asymmetrical, cooperative, and competitive game uh, using pre multiplayer predator and prey horror experiences um, that pits a small group of resourceful survivors against a single player in control of the immortal, relentless slasher icon. So, you know, it's funny because Danny was mentioning about the Evolve beta, which is available currently for people to participate in, and the concept of Evolve is that you get to play as the monster or you get to play as the players opposing the monster. And I do feel that um, using that formula for Jason is a pretty, pretty, it's a pretty cool idea just because it's something we haven't seen. It's a property we haven't messed with in years. And if it's done right, I think it'll be really fun. I mean, from a multiplayer perspective, if you get a, a group of friends, maybe five or five or 10 friends in there and one of them is playing as Jason, you can have a lot of fun. And of course, if you're a longtime horror aficionado like I am, you'll know that, you know, one of the beauties of Friday the 13th were all the unique, creative and individual ways that uh, Jason dispatched camp counselors and countless other individuals throughout the films. And if you're able to integrate that into a game, I think it would be pretty badass. Imagine, you know, you think that you're going to be able to hide in this room and Jason just you know, shoves your head through like a closet door and closes the door on it and kills you, you know, stuff like that as, as grotesque and crazy as it sounds, it's, it's a little bit of a departure from what we're used to. And I, you know, for me, as somebody who grew up playing the original Friday, the 13th game pretty much owns almost all the Jason films for me, it's, you know, it's something that's pretty exciting. And like I said, the concept is cool being able to play as both the counselors and as Jason. As of right now, there is no release date as of yet, but the rumors are pretty strong that it's going to be picked up sooner rather than later. And yes, I do own Jason X. You you are correct, Slick. I do own that movie. 
and I do have a soft spot for that movie for a multitude of reasons. Um, I think I think one of the best scenes in that movie was recreating one of the most iconic murder murders in one of the Friday the Thirteenth films, and that was the sleeping bag scene. Uh, for those of you that have ever seen or or are not aware of this scene. Um, it was from one of the er earlier Friday the 13th films where a girl thinks that Jason won't kill her if she hides in the sleeping bag and zippers it all the way up like a cocoon. Jason, of course, ingenuity at its best, takes said sleeping bag and proceeds to slam it into a tree trunk, hence killing the person hiding inside. And, you know, it, it, it's, you know, call me a little crazy, maybe it's slightly demented, maybe maybe a little sick. But if there's one thing I've learned from Friday the 13th movies is that you can find laughter in some of the most crazy situations. Um, there was one scene I remember. There was a guy in a wheelchair and Jason threw a meat cleaver at the back of his head and he rolled down the steps like O.J. Simpson did in Naked Gun and just proceeded to tumble. And I just laughed my ass off for like 10 minutes straight. Mind you, I was a kid when I saw this. And it was ever since then, I just proceeded to watch all of them because they were so over the top and so bad. And the thing is, and, and you know, I say this all the time, when you're watching films like Friday the 13th, Halloween, any of those films, don't, don't ever think that you're going to get some sort of a deep story or something remotely entertaining because what you're going to get is something that's passable and has a lot of, a lot of low points to complement the one or two high points. But again, the uh, the announcement for a Friday the 13th game, definitely very cool. It is on my radar, and once I hear about it, I will definitely share it with you guys. If you've been on RageWorks.net this week, you'll see that WWE uh, 2K15 released a brand new crop of DLC that you're able to pick up with uh, new moves, including moves for Bray Wyatt, Cesaro, the Usos, and the Bella Twins that you can use with your created superstars, and also a bunch of other moves as well. Uh, there's a variation of Sister Abigail. You got Cesaro's Gut Wrench Suplex. You got Nikki Bella's Rack Attack, the running knee smash that Brie Bella uses, a.k.a. the Shining Wizard. Um, in addition to that, uh, you have a spinning power bomb as well. This DLC pack will run you three ninety nine. So definitely, um, you know, check it out if you're wanting to, um, you know, pick it up. I think, uh, for, in my opinion, uh, you know, it's one of those things where if you're really into the creator wrestler feature, you may want to pick it up. But you're really, you know, a lot of people have been pissed off because, like I said, they invested in the season pass, which was twenty four ninety nine, and now for something like this move lit, this move pack. And all this other stuff, it's definitely going to, you know, it's it's pissing a lot of people off. I've seen people in countless forums. They're like, really, these guys are nickel and diming the shit out of us. Um, I do want to say that the uh, WWE 2K15 Create a Wrestler feature is probably one of the high points of the game. I downloaded a really, really awesome Finn Balor that I'm going to probably use and stream or at minimum capture so I can share with you guys because there are so many creative individuals in that community that some of the stuff they do is just pretty much amazing. Definitely uh, something I recommend you guys check out if you have the game on Xbox One or PlayStation 4. Of course, everybody's talking about Oscar season, and with that, there's countless talk of you know, just the mediums of entertainment as a whole. And the Writers Guild of America actually announced their nominees for Outstanding Achievement in Writing for Video Games. Uh, the award honors some of the best scripts from a video game published in the previous year. Now, there's a lot of good um, games that are nominated this year, including Assassin's Creed Freedom Cry, Assassin's Creed Unity, The Last of Us Left Behind, and Alien Isolation. Of course, the winners will be honored at the 2015 Writers Guild Awards on February 14th, which is going to have a, a simultaneous ceremony in Los Angeles, but also in New York City as well. So, uh, Danny, definitely get that on your radar <laughs> so we can, we can check that out. Anyway, I, I do want to say that I like hearing, um, you know, awards dedicated to gaming that aren't the usual, you know, commercials and well let me let me rephrase that two hour commercials for games from developers that have the deepest pockets i think that writing uh art form and even just the overall execution of some of these games 
is something that really should be respected and honored accordingly. I mean, if you play games, you know, me being a fan of the Assassin's Creed series, especially when you're seeing, you know, so many areas that are recreated so well, or for Rockstar, for instance, um, you know, with GTA, countless GTA games. I mean, when they did the GTA game that took place in New York City, you were able to wander into areas that were similar to, you know, Manhattan, the Bronx, Brooklyn, and you recognize those areas immediately. Thank you, Slick. GTA 4 was the game in question. You know, you'd wander into the middle of what was considered Manhattan and you'd see where the ball would drop in Times Square. And people, you know, people don't think about that stuff. Yes, you become enamored with the beauty of the game and how the game plays. But um, I do think that, you know, it's one thing that you have to look at just the deeper, the deeper work that goes into these games. I started playing... Uh, the latest Tomb Raider game, which is in my backlog catalog. And I was really, really impressed, not only by the writing, but the length that they went to really try and put Lara Croft in peril. And, um, you know, the the way that every part of that was made a mini game. I was definitely impressed. I mean, after playing Uncharted, um, it was nice to see that Tomb Raider borrowed a couple of things from the series. And, de and you know, I've like I've definitely enjoyed what I have seen thus far. All right, um, you guys are going to laugh at this, but if you guys are following us on Instagram, RageWorks underscore Rich, um, you know that I share a lot of updates for my Moto 360 smartwatch, and recently I had a face, a watch face for Baymax from Big Hero 6. Um, I had the opportunity to see Big Hero 6 and really, really enjoyed it, um, not only as an animated feature from Disney, but also as a you know a marvel film also and the funny thing is that you know i have a very big uh funko baymax behind me but big hero 6 is also making its way to little big planet 3 which is releasing a dlc pack for big hero 6 where you can actually buy the costumes individually or as a group but of course if you buy the the group you get a baymax costume so the only way to get that costume is to purchase all the characters. Of course, you know, they got to dangle the carrot somehow. But in any case, if you're playing Little Big Planet 3 and you are a fan of Big Hero 6, much like me, you'll be able to pick up that pack, which is available now. You know, it's 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 one thing that I mentioned before with the Writers Guild Awards that they were talking about The Last of Us Left Behind for writing, but it appears that Sony's throwing its support behind The Last of Us by also creating a special PlayStation 4 bundle, which includes The Last of Us. It is a 500 gig bundle, which is available now with the game for free. It also includes the Left Behind DLC and will run $399. So if you're on the fence about picking up a PlayStation 4 and you are interested in playing The Last of Us, you can pick up that bundle, which is available in stores now for $399. Now, while we're on the subject of picking up new PlayStation 4s and Xbox Ones and games and DLC, um, I do want to talk about an interesting t statistic that came out courtesy of the uh, the very hardworking folks at GameStop in the sense that, and, he, and, he, and I say hardworking because their sales actually declined 6.7% compared to the same period last year. Now, the reason I say this, and I, and I use such sarcasm when referring to the hardworking folks of GameStop is because if you wander into a GameStop most days, it's three or four employees standing around, the store's in complete disarray, and, you know, everything, the model that they utilize is completely antiquated. GameStop now not only buys games, cell phones, tablets, Amiibo figures, um, Skylanders figurines that they resell for practically the same price that they go for uh, retail. But in addition to that, just the model itself of the used game store with regards to GameStop just is incredibly in need of, it's, it, it's definitely in need of being revamped. And the reason I say this is because think about it, your sales went down 6.7%. Um, the reasoning that, they, that, they're, that they're attributing, well, let me rephrase that. They're attributing this decline to the decline of the U.S. dollar. All right, fair enough. 
Um, overall sales have declined for GameStop year over year. Um, they still had $2.9 billion in sales during the holiday season, and sales of new software grew by 5.8%. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because let's, let's think about this. And, and I want to pose it to you guys in the chat room. When you guys go to buy new games, where do you guys go? Do you go to a dedicated specialty retailer like GameStop or Game Trader or any of those? Do you go to a mom and pop or do you go to a big box retailer like Walmart or BJ's or Costco? And um, I'm curious. And the reason I say this is because do you opt to go there because of convenience or do you opt to go there for the sake of, you know, do you opt to go there for the sake of just, you know, the interaction? I see that Brian says the sales are going to go away because of digital downloads. Uh, Uriah, nice to see you in the chat, sir, says, I don't like GameStop anymore. Danny says digital downloads, and she adds, no one wants to go to stores anymore. Slick says, I go to Best Buy because I get money back. Um, I like uh, Brian. I agree. Brian writes, it has nothing to do with the value of the dollar. Thank you. That's that's exactly what I was waiting for. And I'm glad that Brian acknowledged it. The fact that you're using the smoke and mirrors, uh, you know, of the value of a dollar is ridiculous. And the reason I say this is because a game is fifty nine ninety nine always, you know, wh wh whether you go to Best Buy, Target, wherever a brand new release title is fifty nine ninety nine. And with regards to that. You're either going to a retailer based on what Danny said and Slick said about pre-order bonuses or if there's some sort of a perk. I'll be honest. I try not to support GameStop, and the reason I try not to support GameStop is because of their predatory sales tactics and because they continue to, to take advantage of the used game market to the point where it's become a detriment and it's pissed off not only publishers but consumers. Let me, ex let, let me give you guys an example. Let's take uh, let's take a brand new game. You buy a brand new game on Tuesday. You pay fifty nine ninety nine for the game. You decide ah, I'm going to plow through the game. I'm going to have a seat. And when I'm done, I'm going to sell it back to GameStop. You walk into GameStop. You would think, depending on the game, that you would at least get forty five dollars, maybe maybe even thirty or forty bucks. I've seen people walk in with a game that is a week old and get a $15 offer, 20 if they use the trade-in feature. And the worst part is that that same game that is a week old will, be, would a, will have a sticker on it for $54.99. You know, that's, it, it, it's, it's insanity. It is insanity to me that people continue to be taken to the cleaners by GameStop, considering that there's countless other ways that you can go. You can go eBay, you can go Amazon, you can rent the games from Gamefly, which is what I do. That's why I have such a huge backlog of games. Or you can just trade them amongst friends or wait till there's a special, a Black Friday deal, or, you know, buy two, get one free, buy one, get one half off. If there's anything that retailers aren't trying to do is earn your money. On the contrary, retailers have gone out of their way to earn your money, including, you know, buy two, get one free, buy one, get one half off. Slick can attest to some of these sales because Slick and I talk about them off air. Uh, you know, Toys R Us is a good spot. They do some really good deals. Best Buy on occasion does some good ones. Um, you know, Target on occasion does some pretty solid ones. And that's what I'm saying. There's, you know, and, and, you know, Brian says in all fairness, GameStop does need to make their margins and don't misunderstand Brian. I agree, but I do feel that there's a fine line between making the margins and bending your customers over and giving it to them with no lube. You know, th th these are the facts. If I were to go and spend $60 in your establishment for a game that I finish in possibly five days, the least you could do is say, Hey, We'll give you, you know, 35, we'll give you half or a little over half. And if you trade it in, we'll give you a little bit more. And if you say, hey, 40 bucks for a game, that means I, in essence, I only paid $20 for it. It's not so bad. But when you have some of these kids go in there, they've saved up all their money. 
They finish the game. They want to trade it in. Sometimes it's a week. Maybe it's two weeks tops. And you're offering, you know, young kids $15 for a $60 game. It is an insult. You know, it's an insult just not only to the to the consumer, but to the fact that that value of that game, you're still going to make back almost exactly what you're going to sell it for at retail. On the contrary, and, and you know, the, the way I see it is, you know, when, when you're in a situation where where you're trading games in, and, and you know, I'm going to give Brian his due. Brian says the facts are that you should be happy you can resell games in the first place. I, I understand that, but I also look at it in terms of tangible goods. You have your movies, you have your games. Those are items that can still be enjoyed by other people for a fraction of a price. And I, I again, I respect what, what any retailer's trying to do because you got to make a buck where you can. Like I said, I'm just not a fan of predatory sales practices, and I'm also not a fan of gouging the used market to the point where people just feel that they're insulted when they sell you a game. You know, that's, that's the way I see it. I mean, if you, if you buy a game and you pay 50, you know, if you pay $60 for it again, I don't expect you to get $45. Fuck. I don't even expect you to get 40, but at minimum, at minimum half price for, for, for a five-star title. You know, if you trade in the latest GTA and the game is two weeks old or three weeks old, you should have a shelf life of a month. On the contrary, here's what I would establish. I would have thresholds. The game would the game would be guaranteed a price of, you know, a, a return of 50 percent if you trade it in within 30 days. That's it. And then for every for every day after that the value goes down even $45 within the first 15 days, $30 within the next 30 days. And then after that, it's whatever, whatever they choose to give you. I think at least that way it's unilateral and it's something where people can feel comfortable doing business with your establishment. But again, there would be, there would be exclusions, namely Madden because Madden is a great example. Um, you know, Madden is a great example because think about it. With Madden, that game is outdated within the first three weeks in some cases. And when, with regards to that, you know, it's, um, it, you know, for, with Madden, the way I always see it with Madden is people, people are done with it within the first, um, people are done with Madden, I'd like to say, within the first month. Maybe the first month, that, or, you know, once football, correction, let me rephrase that. Once football season is over, the interest in Madden tends to wane. So what I would say is that if you're trading in a copy of Madden within the first month, you'll be able to, to scoop it for half price, you know, or you'll be at least, like I said, the establish some thresholds this way. The retailer is, it looks okay for, for the consumer and the retailer isn't going to be looked at like a complete sack of shit. And that's where, that's what I'm talking about. Just establish a baseline. You buy a game within the first, you know, two weeks, if you want to be generous, or even the first month, you're entitled to get half off if you trade it back in. Game has to be in mint condition, include the book, et cetera, et cetera. You know, all the usual crap. And you're able to get half your money towards a new game. In essence, you're ending, you're really paying half price for that game. And then you're making $30 back to buy a new title. And then after that, all bets are off. That's it. At least that way, people know what they're in for. And then if you take the game and you get your $30 for it and you decide to sell it for $54.99 or $49.99, it doesn't look super terrible. That's all I'm saying. You know, these predatory practices, the shit has to stop. Now, you know, it's not all, it's not all bad news for GameStop as they attributed uh, growth in sales to new software and... Um, you know, the, the, the sales of PS4 and Xbox One saw a 94% increase, but hardware did see a 32% decline in sales when compared to the same period in 2013. Um, the company's quote-unquote pre-owned value sales category remained largely unchanged, seeing a slight increase of 1%. So, you know, it's something that you definitely got to consider. And again, 
predatory sales practices are really the bigger issue at GameStop. And, you know, things like that, retraining, uh, creating a baseline with regards to uh, trading in games would really just make it a, a more pleasurable experience, not only for, for the people that the associates, because they'll know how to, how to sell people correctly, but just for the retailer as a whole. I mean, it sucks that people are stuck with this stigma. You're well, correction. It sucks for GameStop that, that they're, that they're, they have this stigma uh, that they're this shitty retailer. I mean, there's good people that work in certain GameStops that are slaves to the masters of corporate. And as such, they got to do what they got to do to make a buck. But, you know, it's unfortunate that the overall model for the for the business is just so, so terrible. And I think with with a little change here or there, they would probably be they would probably not be viewed as shitty as they have been. Anyway, I just got word. We got a call. Uh, let me uh, let me bring Brian in. Hey, Brian, what's going on, buddy? Hey, the Rich, uh, doing good. I wanted to comment about what your conversation here about uh, GameStop, used games, and sort of the pricing and that kind of stuff, right? Sure, um, let's hear I'd it. Say, first off, games are a great value, right? Yes. At the uh, it's $49, dollars $60, $60 price because the fact is you figure go see a movie that's $14, $15, $20, bucks maybe whatever, you know. Right. And that's one time you, you, it goes away, right? Correct. You know? You don't have any sort of you know, to sort of see it over and over again that price game something you get a chance to do for quite a while. They put a lot of effort and time into making those games and everything, so it's pretty good. But it's expensive. I mean, you consider what if you want to develop a library. I mean, it definitely gets it does start adding up. You of know? course. Um, but I agree that I agree that if you actually have something that you're bought at fifty dollars and they only give you fifteen dollars. That's really a low ball offer. Yep. And unfortunately, it sounds like they don't let you, you know, negotiations when it talks about, when you talk about use things, generally speaking, you can't have negotiation. Usually you have a negotiation ability to say, look, I think this is worth more. Nope. And then you can go back and forth. But you don't take their first offer. That's nope. how it's supposed to work. Of right? course. I but agree. I'm sure, best, you know, these guys don't have that. They, uh, so they don't, the stores don't have the, the power to, to go up from the 15, it sounds like. Is that right? No, what they're doing is they usually say, we'll give you 15 cash, we'll give you 20 if you trade it in towards another item that you're purchasing in the store. That's usually, you get a slight right. markup but, based on that, or if you're part of their stupid rewards program. But, but they're not going to say, let's say, well, we, let's go 25, 30 or something like that, or whatever, nope. because, which would be more fair, the way I see it. Of course. That's a problem because, you know, like I say, you're right, 100%. If somebody plays something for a week, the game still has a lot of marketable value still after a week mm -hmm. of being on the shelf and being sellable. And the fact is they have nothing to do. They don't have to do – all they can do is take the box, put it back on the shelf, maybe like put a little sticker on the thing and be done with it. There's no real major labor cost for them to do anything with that. That's right? correct. You know, so wh where where is this – you know, why are they getting so much margins? I agree with you about that. That's crazy margins. It doesn't make any sense. Well, the the funny thing is that they realize that they're one of the few reputable quote unquote games in town with regards to buying games back from people. I mean, from from a local standpoint, the only options you have locally are either mom and pops where you can do, like you said, negotiate or Craigslist. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, that's kind of sketchy. Right. And you hope for the best. But other than that, they know that everything right. else requires more legwork. If you list a game on eBay, you got to pay the listing right. fees and deal with the crap. Exactly. So, you know, they, they, they mm -hmm. understand That's how right. they have you. They kind of have you by the short and curly, so to speak, with regards to that. But like I said, all it takes is to make an adjustment in terms of how it's done. You know, like I said, with uh, trading the, the game within the first 30 days or 15 days of purchase, you get half back to, uh, you know, in trade. Right. And, and people would be like, damn, you know, well, you get it, half off. It's not bad. One point I also could say here, too, is this is something that maybe it's something that maybe GameStop, I don't want to say shouldn't be doing. Maybe, maybe they're kind of maybe in the wrong business doing this. So cause it sounds like they're not really handling it well. You know, I mean, they don't have the, the model set up correctly. So people are getting a good deal and then able to kind of like keep the, keep the momentum going. Yeah, they give you just you know, five bucks. It sounds like if you want to buy another game from them. But right. it's not like they're really... You know, it's again like I said, they're taking too much off the top, and there should be some competitive pressure someplace where you get some more money out of it. And like you're right, 100%. eBay is a pain. Yep. Same reason why people go out and sell their cell phones to one of these 
vendors like um, Gazelle, I mean, not to give a plug, but I'm saying this is an example, right? Yeah, you know? it's true. Just the fact that you go on eBay and make more money, but yet, you know, you have the issue, which is I'm going to have to, or Craigslist or whatever, I'm going to have to go and list it. I'm going to basically follow up on the listing. I'm going to go through this whole entire process. There's just effort, you know? Right. And yeah, I mean, so there you go. I, I just, I agree. It's definitely not good, but, you know, and hopefully, uh, something changes there and including the digital download that's really becomes a problem because like I, I don't know if you have a, if you have a digital download there there is no real market for used digital downloads of anything well, no there, uh, there's who, not it and on know, the contrary you know. <laughs> well you know it's funny you mentioned that because when digital downloads were becoming the main focus for both PlayStation 4 and Xbox one GameStop was quaking mm -hmm. in their boots at the time because they didn't know what they were gonna do because it, think about it. If you're only subsisting on digital downloads and and because of it, you're saving money not only on shipping, but you're also saving money on packaging. You're also saving money on the instruction mm -hmm. manual. You're saving money on countless things. The only problem is that retail, uh, you know, uh, publishers don't see it that way. If you're t if you're telling me that I'm going to get a digital game that I don't get a box, I don't have to go to the store and whatever, then it really shouldn't be 60 bucks at that point. I agree 100% too. You and know? That's something that bothers me too because they're not exactly, there's no, there's no labor costs, there's no shipping costs, there's no, none of that other stuff. Exactly. It's, it's easy. They that's it. Run a server. I mean, sure, the server farms may cost a billion dollars. I understand that is expensive stuff to run the server farms, but still, y it's easier. There's no question. And then, yeah, yeah, it should be less. Well, you know, that's one of the, that's one of the things so, that, that people that are hardcore PC, gamers they really like to kind of throw in console gamers faces because they'll say you know you go on steam that game that you just paid 60 dollars for i may pay 20 bucks for it or 15 bucks for it or i'll wait for a steam really? sale and buy the wow. game for a dollar it's crazy <laughs> it's crazy shit well man. i mean and they have a point you know they have a point but then again you know, people want the more the consoles they like, the appliance environment, I'm sure, right? Where of course. you can just get up and play and they're not screwing around with drivers, they're not plus you know, having to become a computer expert to get every little last inch of compatibility, you know, of, of gameplay out of the deal versus just walking up to a console and just playing. So yeah, you're gonna pay. That's just that's what it is, unfortunately. But I, I just like I it's unfortunate, like I said, it sounds like they're especially the the people that work in the stores that are not just standing around, not doing anything and, and not keeping the store clean and, you know, and really not uh, providing really very much of a value other than just sort of an easy trade-in process, which right. it's, it may end up drying up. Anyways, I, I feel a digital download is going to take over. It just, it's a matter of time. It doesn't seem like it, people buying physical media really does seem like it's going away. So, well, you know, know the numbers is? on it, but I just seem to be. No, you're, and, and you, and you have a point, but you know what the problem is with physical, with the, uh, with the digital medium, you, there's still not a way for you to protect yourself if a service goes out. Like, for instance, you go on iTunes, Correct. you buy you buy the Star Wars trilogy, and knock on wood, you have mm -hmm. the movie, you watch it as many times as you want, five years from now, Apple tanks, and it disappears. Yep. Then you just lost that movie. Yep. Like, there's no way for you to yep. even get that with some sort of a DRM and have it somewhere, physically. Well, and that's, that's another point. That's another point about DRMs, exactly, which is the problem, which, again, the users get no rights at all with that deal, and it's all on the publisher's side. It's the, you know, they, they get to hold all the keys, and like you said, the server goes out of the business, or even they decide, or if they decide just to pull it. I mean, it can not even the server goes away. The deals could change, you right. know, where they go out and say, we're not going to host this anymore. It just may not be available as a digital thing anymore. So you may have purchased it, but it, like you're right, you may not be able to get to it, so... I mean, the laws have to change. I agree. I think the way I look at it, really, it's all becomes a question of copyright laws and having people that are a little smarter than the people we have currently working well, in our Congress and the, in, in the government that sort of understands these issues and kind of gets the idea that we have to flip it around the other way because too much right now feels on the other side, which is people who make things, digital, digital stuff they're selling, have got too many rights now where they can just do what they want to do and us as consumers get nothing you know, out of yep. the deal. And it's like, you know, we need, we need the other way to go a little bit the other way. So, like I say, I agree. Have something be where you have a certain amount of time limits on well, be games or books or whatever, where there's a certain the copyright is available, but otherwise it becomes free in essence, or it starts going down in price or something. I mean, you got to have like some graduated scale there. You right. Know? I mean, um, 
you know, I don't know what the numbers are. Like I said, you're right. Maybe it's, maybe it's 30 days, maybe it's 15 days, maybe it's a month, maybe it's a year. There's going to be some numbers there that'll work for everyone. But the way it's as great as now, it's not good. So, well, let me. Anyways, let, I just wanted to call in about that issue. Yeah, before before I let you go, Brian, here's here's a statistic that I'm going to give you that the uh, the interview made thirty million dollars in just online sales wow. and rentals, online sales and rentals. I talked about this wow. last week and I said that this was <laughs> partially due to controversy, but partially a well-planned experiment because think about it. You just made $30 million without having to worry about people cleaning up movie theaters or worrying about people mm -hmm. selling concessions or whatever. Mm -hmm. How crazy is that? Well, and that's the thing, and actually a good point about that, because that movie, if you understand, it really wasn't, I didn't see it myself, but a lot of people are saying it really wasn't that great, and to make that much money on a movie because of the controversy, because whatever, it made, I'm sure it made maybe more money than it would have if it just come to the theaters and people heard about it and then like, oh, this isn't good, and moved on, you know, so. Yep. Um, and Big you're it. right, 100% right about the concessions and everything else. And unfortunately, that's another point, too, for theaters. Yeah, those guys are going to lose out also, and they already mm -hmm. are. It you know, is inevitable, so. my friend. But I figured I'd share that with you before I let you go. It is. I, I appreciate you calling cool, cool in, Brian. Thanks. You are, you're the man. Thanks. Thanks, you too. Keep the good work. Thanks, brother. See ya. Bye. All right, guys. That was the one and only Brian Monroe, as always, a staple in the, in the uh, GFQ chat, always bringing a lot of great knowledge and insight to any call he has. I did want to say this, uh, just to, to wrap things up. Digital distribution, like Brian mentioned, um, you know, is one of those things where it needs to have a tighter, not a tighter strap, but it needs to be more streamlined because, like I said, you buy a game, it's your money, you should at least have a way to keep that game on your, you know, on your system and not have to worry about down the road, well, correction, you can keep it on your system, but after that, all bets are off. If your hard drive crashes, you might be able to re-download it. Uh, but what if there's a server attack, et cetera, et cetera? You may not be able to access the game. There's so many variables with regards to digital distribution currently. I think that within... I did not want to burp into the microphone, hence why I muted the microphone. Anyway, <laughs> I, um, I, did, I did want to say that with regards to di digital distribution, I do feel that... We're, we're, we're approaching a, an, an, an era where things are slowly inching forward. I mean, like I said, the interview was a great example of that in the sense that, um, you know, they were able to um, really kind of move things forward. I mean, the whole release of the interview was obviously, like I said, it was one part uh, sticking it to North Korea, but it was also the other part was testing the waters of a complete digitally distributed box office film and seeing if the amount of revenue was enough to generate a noticeable response and 30 million dollars is pretty fucking noticeable all right i see slick is uh ready to chime in as well let me bring him in mr slick what do you got my friend what's up man I don't know, dude. We got DRM. We got GameStop. We got companies double dipping, triple dipping, companies losing money. It's just a debacle out there. Cats and dogs living together. It's anarchy. <laughs> well, part of the anarchy, you know, it does it does fall back on the evil of GameStop. <laughs> and um, with the recent... Uh, announcement of the new 3ds xl oh yeah i really want to get on gamestop because i've been trying to find it you know the details and i really can't i went to their website and i really can't find it but gamestop is offering you a hundred dollars off if you trade in your current 3ds uh for the for the new 3ds sorry if you trade in the 3ds xl for the new one you get a hundred dollars off you get seventy five dollars off if you trade in the regular three D S or like a two D S. Okay. So that means you can get the new three D S XL for either a hundred or hundred and twenty five dollars if you get the Monster Hunter bundle. My problem with this is you gotta physically hand GameStop or mail into GameStop your old three D S. 
I could see it working if you're doing the, um, really, I can't see it working because I can't see them giving you the discount and giving you the item before they get your physical old DS in their hand. Yeah. And the problem with that is when you get a new DS, for anybody who's ever had more than one, you know, there's, aside from what's on your memory card, there's, um, you know, the stuff that's physically saved on the memory of the, the handheld itself. Right. And when you get a new DS, you know, it it gives you the ability to transfer that information from the old portable to the new one. Right. And you got to have both of them in hand online to do that. Like, you got to have three things. you got to have both DSs and the computer. Right. How are you doing that if you give GameStop your old 3DS? Like, for example, and we mentioned it on air a, a few months ago that they gave customers the um, the option to get a free game. And I myself, I got the uh, the Wind Waker for free, and that's not on my memory card. That's on my 3DS XL. Right. So when I get the new one, I got to transfer that to the new 3DS XL. Plus, I got to transfer whatever's on my memory card because the new 3DS XL doesn't use the same SD card as the old one. The old one used a full-size SD card. The new one uses a micro SD. Well, this is what happens. So you physically can't use the same memory card. Well, this is what happens. Not to cut you off, this is what happens when you put the keys in uh, uh, the keys of the kingdom into the hands of the retailer. Like if this would have been handled by Nintendo, where say, hey, um, send in your send in your 3DS to GameStop. GameStop will give you a code that you will in turn redeem for a voucher to get the new system. Or maybe when you turn your, your game in at GameStop, like Brian just said, they do a transfer. No different than when you go to a cell phone store, buy a new, buy a new phone and transfer the save over. At least, at least in that respect, Nintendo should be forming a partnership or something with GameStop for that sort of a transition. The same way that you could go and get rare Pokemon Maybe you can create something that would allow them to transfer that data to a new system. I mean, you know what I'm talking about, right? When you go to a cell phone store and buy a new phone and they go, hey, do you want to move your contacts and everything over? And they plug it into two machines. And next thing you know, boom, everything is moved over. And then you spend the next 20 minutes trying to figure out who Mr. P is. <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, and I was, I was just collecting what Brian was saying. I'm trying to check it as I'm talking, but if I remember correctly from when I got the 3DS XL, right. you not only, like I said, you need three things. You need both DSs and you need a computer because you need to be connected to the internet. Right, but that's what I'm so saying. it's not like you just transfer the information from one console to the next by, by like, regular, well, the DS doesn't even have like Bluetooth or anything, and only the new DS has the near field communication. So that's not going to work with just the two devices in store. You gotta have, you gotta be at home to do that. No, I I understand what you're saying, but what I'm talking about is if if this was if this was already in motion. Let me let me let me throw this out there. If if this was in motion with Nintendo and GameStop, and they said, hey, listen, we want to do this promotion. Blah, 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 blah. Nintendo would in turn say, hey, um, you know, given our hardware restrictions and blah, 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 we're going to need to find a way around this because you're going to get an influx of people that are going to be pissed off that are going to lose their stuff. Here's what we have a solution for you, whether it's a software kit or maybe it's a little dongle or something. You go plug your systems in the, con the you know, the dongle does its magic. Boom. Your stuff gets moved to the new system. You know what I'm saying? And that's just with regards to just a partnership with Nintendo. I mean, if Nintendo's entrusting this to GameStop and they're doing all these special things, you know, special rare Pokemon releases, all this stuff, how difficult would it be to create something that would allow that to be done right there in the store so that you don't have to worry about sending it and hoping that the goodwill of the store will, will you know, fall in your favor? 
Well, I mean, the easy thing to do would be to, um, if Nintendo had, uh, what do you call it, cloud storage, but they don't. You know? They don't, they don't have the cloud I mean, storage. If they had cloud storage, it doesn't matter, because, like, if this were, say, like, a, a PlayStation-type thing, at least your game saves are backed up on their cloud service, which people may or may not trust because of problems that they've had with hackers, but whatever. At least it would be there. Well, this is this is how I, the, you know, cloud serve, you know, cloud storage is one good way to look at it, and and you know what, we would love for Nintendo to implement that, but you know, Nintendo takes their sweet ass time. But like I said, you know, just just a, a small piece of hardware, a small box. Hey, you know, bring your DSs in, you charge them over, open your new DS. Hey, we're gonna plug it in, move your shit over, wham bam, thank you, ma'am, and that's it. Tell, answer me this: when you comp when you migrated from one DS to the other at home. How long did the entire process take you? It took a few minutes, but still required me to be at home. Like I said, I'm, I'm trying to check it while I'm talking to you, and I'm not getting the information I need. But right, but, but it, it seems like it's not going to work out very well for those people who have a lot of digital data on their their 3DS, which is a lot of people because of the Nintendo Shop. Right. Well, I'm not. I'm not trying to put you, you know, Johnny, on the spot with regards to that. Um, I just, I'm just trying to make it from the standpoint of that, you know, you're able to get this. You're able to get this, these, this brand new system, and um, you know, you got your hands on it. And the thing that bothers me is that when you look at it, you say to yourself, "Oh shit," you know, I can't, I can't get my hands on my stuff. Until, you know, I either I, I find a way to get the stuff off beforehand or I'm at the mercy of GameStop. And this is what I'm saying. You know, there's got to be a way around it. And Nintendo probably has some something that or at least can execute bringing something to market like that in the future. Because you pose you pose not only a great argument, but you also pose something that's going to piss a lot of people off. And Brian says the easy thing to do would be to just get both consoles and then sell the older one once you have the data transfer. Yes, I agree. But the problem there is GameStop's not going to give you that 100 bucks for just selling the, the, the old 3DS to them versus giving it to you as money towards the new 3DS. Right. They're not going to give you that value. It's going to be, again, that whole problem getting... The fifteen bucks for the the sixty dollar game that you purchased a week ago. Yep, and 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 that and that like I you know we were talking about before that's going to be a matter of just trust as well, you know like you're trusting this retailer for that. So it, it's it's just an incredibly an incredibly poor and poor and lame thought out plan. It's like yeah we're gonna do this and it's gonna be great and you're gonna trade your system in and it's like oh yeah but wait, you're gonna lose X for your troubles. It's insanity. In fact, I just checked. Cash value for the Nintendo 3DS XL, if it comes with the AC adapter and stylus, which seems silly to even mention, but not a lot of people have all that. Yep. The trade value is $64. There you go. The trade credit is $80. There you Either go. Way, you're not getting a hundred dollar deal if you try to give them the thing after the fact. Yep. The only the only thing is, you know, like and Brian, I agree, Brian. Don't don't deal with GameStop, but that's that's the whole point because they're the one making this big stink of traders your old 3ds XL to get the new 3ds XL. Right. And I'm like, screw that. Yeah, I I think I think the smart money is going to have to be buy the new one. Migrate everything over, sell the old one privately, and hope for the best. Yeah, I mean, I'd sell the old one privately at best. You know, always, you know, how I'm always, you know, recycling. I'd, I'd give it to a little kid that doesn't have one. There you go. Sooner but even if I'd you sold it, it stuff. dude, even if you sold it for 100 clams, you'd be all right. There you go. What you could do to, you know, like, a parent that, you know, is trying to get something for their kid but doesn't want to spend full full price. Absolutely. 
There you go. Anything else you want to add, my friend? No, nah, not on that. Not on that matter. There you go. All right. Um, as always, you can find Slick on Twitter at MTR Slick, and uh, you can always interact with him on our Facebook fan page. Uh, that's going to wrap up the entertain the uh, the gaming segment. We're going to jump into some entertainment. Slick, you are welcome to stick around or call back, whichever you choose. I'll probably call back. There you go. All right, buddy. I'll catch up with you later. All right, man. Peace. Peace. There you go. You know, Slick, Brian, everybody in the chat posed a lot of great questions with regards to not only the uh, the strategies of GameStop, but also, in Slick's case, what's happening with this brand new release of the 3DS, which obviously has pissed a lot of people off because of the uh, lack of AC adapter, amongst other things. I want to get... I want to definitely get to the bottom of that before I do the, um, you know, before I, I do next week's show so I can talk about it at length. So that's the only reason why I have not brought that up. Um, Slick says that the AC adapter is no issue. I have like four DS adapters here. Slick, if, if that's just you, um, you know, it's uh, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, some people are going to get mad about it for nothing, but, um, exactly. Unless you never had a DS before, uh, Brian, I see what you're saying about my Twitter account. Uh, just want to let you know that I have my take radio for the show stuff, but you can also follow at rage underscore works. If you want to get all the latest updates in regards to that. Uh, I always forget to mention that. Excuse me. Uh, oh, actually, <laughs> My fault. Thank you for that, Slick. <laughs> I thought he was referring to me. Slick definitely needs to get his Twitter game up. Uh, to answer your question, Slick, no, I am not drinking Coquito on air. I am actually drinking alkaline water. Uh, recommendation from a good friend of mine that's supposed to be good for me. So um, that is, but it is, it definitely is a wine jug. It definitely looks like a wine jug. So I, I'm glad you asked. So nobody would think that I was getting lit on air. But no, I am not drinking any booze. Just some good old-fashioned healthy alkaline water along with some sparkling Dasani lemon in a can. Anyway, as I said, do your do your research. Make sure that you're getting the most value for your systems. And, um, you know, definitely if you got any questions, I'm sure Slick will gladly answer them for you, whether it's on Twitter, on our Facebook fan page, or in, on any other social media outlet where you keep up with all his doings anyway let's wrap this up let's get into some entertainment news there's quite a bit to discuss i, I definitely want to address the spider-man rumor which has been floating around which i know a lot of people are excited about but don't get your hopes up too high folks because it may not happen anyway let's talk movies and tv shall we All right, so let's get let's get the elephant in the room out of the way, and that is the rumor that Sony and Marvel have come into an agreement to utilize Spider-Man in Avengers: Infinity War. Uh, there's various schools of thought with regards to this. There are people that are saying that it's done. There are people that are saying that it's rumors and speculation. There are other people that are saying that negotiations are ongoing. There's reps for Sony that are doing the old deny, 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 deny. And then there's what I got to say, and this is it. The fact is that, like I said, and Hugh Jackman said in previous interviews, there's an opportunity for everyone to make money in this scenario, whether it's um, Disney and Marvel creating the film and Sony distributing it or them splitting distribution rights or Marvel creating its own series of Spider-Man films that Sony would distribute. There are ample opportunities for everyone to win in this equation. Sony, Fox need to realize that the properties that they hold are part of a unified universe. The Fantastic Four, the X-Men, the Avengers, Ghost Rider, Blade, all these heroes are, all exist in a unified universe. And the problem with that is that 
when Marvel farmed out all their properties, nobody thought in a million years that Marvel would have their own studio cranking out their own kick-ass movies and making billions upon billions of dollars. Obviously, that is the name of the game. But with regards to that, let's let's play devil's advocate. Let's say that Sony and Marvel come to terms and you see Spider-Man in Avengers Infinity War. Everybody would be excited about that. But there's there's its own set of challenges. If the rumors are to be believed, they don't want to use Andrew Garfield as Spider-Man anymore. As such, you have to go through the trouble of casting a brand new uh, actor to portray everyone's favorite friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Sure, no problem. But then you're also running into the whole, all right, we're going to make a brand new series of Spider-Man films, which of course is going to need to tell you the origin story again, and Uncle Ben getting killed again. And then maybe, you know, you can fast forward through half of that and do some other stuff. But it's a risk that you're going to take because Marvel's going to want to do their own spin on their signature character. And people don't realize that, yes, you can fast forward through most of the origin. But the fact still remains that Marvel's going to want to do their character justice. And as such, it's going to require them needing those guys having to go back in the lab and create a Spider-Man that is, um, you know, a, a fit for the, for the current established Marvel Cinematic Universe. As, as far as Andrew Garfield is concerned, I do feel that Andrew Garfield was a great Spider-Man. I think he's, he's probably one of the guys that embodies the whole Peter Parker mentality the best. But I will say this, if, if, Sony, if Sony was to go and share Spider-Man with Marvel and Marvel was to do its own Spider-Man films, the first things I would do is I would ditch Peter Parker in high school. We've seen it a dozen fucking times already. You know, you can tell his the, the passing of Uncle Ben in flashbacks if you want, and maybe advance it forward a little bit, but don't spend too much of, uh, you know, don't spend the bulk of the movie telling an origin story that everybody knows. It's like, Guy gets bitten by radioactive spider, uncle dies, great power, responsibility, blah, blah, blah. Here we go, swinging through the neighborhood, saving everybody, punching bad guys in the face, wisecracks, and credits. That's how it should be. Quick, easy, and to the point. But, like I said, you're running the risk of, for, for the necessity to have Spider-Man involved, there's going to need to be some sacrifices that are going to have to be made either from a casting standpoint, for those of you that like Andrew Garfield, and you're going to run the risk of losing him, to obviously having to deal with the possible retelling of an origin story we already know. So again, there is a lot of excitement on the internet. Everybody's going crazy about it, and, and that's fine. You know, it's, it's a great thing. Don't misunderstand. I think it's great, and a unified Marvel Universe is important. But again... You're either going to have to acknowledge the existing continuity that Sony has created, or you're going to need to create your own continuity. And with that comes the frustration of another origin story. So with that, I, I want to take a wait and see approach. Like I say, the rumors change every day. Some days it's yes, Spider-Man's in the movie. Other days it's no, no, he's not, not yet. Um, let's take a wait and see approach for the time being. And the fact that it's even being entertained gives me hope that within the next five years, we're either going to have all the characters under the Marvel umbrella or the studios are going to be willing to the, the studios are going to be willing to make concessions to allow those characters to be used in various films. Fox, I'm looking at you guys with Wolverine and the X-Men to lead the charge. Don't disappoint me. Anyway, let's uh, switch gears. I want to talk about the first bit of what the fuck movie news that popped up this week. Uh, Variety is reporting that um, Andrew Adamson, who did Shrek and Chronicles of Narnia, is working on a film with Sony and Michael Bay's Platinum Dunes production company uh, based on the IDW comic Zombies vs. Robots. Now, the reason that I'm throwing this in the what the fuck movie news category is because Cowboys vs. Aliens was such a great success that I'm sure all of you are chomping at the bit to watch a movie about zombies and robots. Now, the concept and the storyline is is interesting, but the fact that you're even doing this may not be as good as we would like. Anyway, 
Uh, the, the comic book follows a group of robots who are protecting a young girl from a group of intelligent zombies. This girl is considered the last human on Earth. Again, a little bit of, um, you know, there, there's a little there's a little bit of just post apocalyptic, post apocalyptic destruction there. But again, zombies and robots after the debacle that was cowboys and aliens, I, you know, leave it alone. And besides the fact that if we continue to oversaturate the market with comic book movies, people are going to end up detesting them and not wanting to deal with them. This happened a couple of years back when I worked in a movie theater and we went through an entire year of disaster movies. It was Day After Tomorrow, Dante's Peak, um, Cliffhanger, uh, Volcano with Tommy Lee Jones and Anne Heche. Uh what else do we have? Just a, there was an entire, there was, a, it had to have been that entire year that it was all natural disaster flicks and it got to oh twister. And by the time it was all said and done, people just didn't want to deal with it anymore. So again, comic book movies, uh, it's the easy way out, but there's so many other properties out there, um, that I'd, I'd really like to see people, you know, kind of go into some other areas. Uh, I was talking to a couple of friends of mine and we were talking about just old eighties cartoons and, um, eighties cartoons are, are the, uh, you know, they're, they're one of those things that me being an eighties baby, I'm going to reference a lot, but if you look at a lot of eighties cartoons and a lot of eighties properties, some of those are real easy films that can translate that are well, correction. Those are easy properties that can translate to the big screen. Let me give you guys an example. Mask. If you guys remember, Mask was a cartoon with um, a bunch of special agents that would drive specially modified cars that would transform, and the villains, of course, had their cars that would transform as well. Now, the first thing you're going to think is Transformers, but let's let's take it one step further. You can actually create a, a pretty decent franchise out of that, not to mention the fact that forming partner relationships with various automakers to get those cars on screen would be would be really cool to see. And, um, again, the storyline was pretty good. It borrows elements of 007, um, you know, has its fair share of action and it has, uh, you know, a ragtag group of characters. And I think that's a property that would be interesting to see on the big screen. Of course, the, uh, the really big kid in me would love to see a, a big screen version of Centurions, which, um, if you're curious as to what that cartoon is about, uh, it's about, uh, three guys, who use special modified armor uh, related to the elements air, sea, and land. And um, those guys fight uh, a guy who's half cyborg named Doc Terror and his uh, companion Hacker. And, uh, you know, those guys, you could, um, yeah, that was five guys later. Thank you, Slick. It's true. Centurion started with three and then went to five. And, um, again, a property that with the effects and all the stuff that's there, um, you know, you could have a good time with that. And the reason I say this is, oh man, Rich, you're giving Hollywood uh, another crutch for them to use. But it's not even that. It's just that, think about it. You've got all these comic movies being cranked out, cranked out constantly. And then you're going to tap the well dry. But at least if you go into some of these other properties, like I said, you know, they're bringing Gem to the big screen. Uh, you know, they brought G.I. Joe to the big screen and it's done pretty well. Um... You know, Transformers, love it or hate it, it's made it's made the studio Paramount a shit a shit ton of money. Um, other properties, I like I said, Mask, Centurions, the Inhumanoids would be really good. Uh, you could borrow you know some elements from Avatar with regards to that. You could do a little bit of an environmental vibe with that. Plus, the effects for some of the monsters would be phenomenal. Um, and again, these are properties that a lot of you guys may not know of, but if you look them up, you'll understand where I'm coming from. I'd like to see, you know, just like a family version of the Bionic 6. Uh, that would be an awesome live action film. You can have a lot of fun with that again, and you can even recast that a certain way just to make it more modern. You don't have to have, you know, the white family with the token black kid. You know, you can have just a, a, a family made up of exactly how most modern families are that aren't just one color or one nationality and um you know you can have you can have a blast with stuff like that and again i'm going into i'm going into the um you know i'm going into uh, a genre and an age of cartoons that 
may be obscure to, to most, you know, 90s kids, but even 90s kids have their own share of cartoons that they wouldn't mind seeing adapted for the big screen. Um, I, here's, here's a cartoon that's obscure as fuck, but I think would probably be interesting to see on screen, and that would be Galtar and the Golden Lance. It doesn't even have to be named that, but you can borrow that and do that because that cartoon was practically a movie all its own. I mean, you know, if we're if we're going to go a little higher up the spectrum, you know, you can do Pirates of Dark Water and create a brand new franchise a la Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, wow, the mighty Orbots. Here's here's one. And this one is a is a no brainer for Disney. How about a big screen version of Gargoyles? How about that? Big screen version of Gargoyles with a really good voice cast, awesome CGI. It would it would make a, a shitload of money. These guys would be counting money hand over fist. You know, all the Gargoyles named after all the New York landmarks. You got Xanatos and all the armored Gargoyles. It would be tremendous. Again, just, just giving you the ideas, Hollywood. I'm just, I'm just writing them out, handing them off, and uh, giving them away. But anyway, figured I'd share that with you guys. On the comic side of things... Um, rumors are getting very, very strong that Viola Davis will be uh, Amanda Waller in the Suicide Squad, but she will also be in multiple DC films, uh, much like Samuel L. Jackson with Nick Fury. Of course, one of the gags I've always had about Amanda Waller is that she is Nick Fury in a dress, minus the eye patch. Slick knows this all too well. I think Viola Davis being the, uh, the great actress that she is would do the role justice. And seeing her in multiple films and being one of the, the driving forces in a unified DC universe would definitely be interesting. So once it's officially confirmed, of course, I will share it with you guys. As of right now, Suicide Squad heads to the big screen. Jared Leto as the Joker. Margot Robbie as Harlequin. Cara Delvine as Enchantress. Jai Courtney as Boomerang. And originally, Tom Hardy was going to play Rick Flagg. But unfortunately, he dropped out of the film due to other commitments. Right now, all signs are pointing towards them possibly giving the role to Jake Gyllenhaal. Again, not 100% confirmed yet, but Tom Hardy is definitely out of Suicide Squad. So there you have it. Now, you know, I was I was looking at this bit of news and I said to myself, you know, there's there's something that can be done uh, with uh, a lot of properties that isn't happening, especially now. With, with so many properties going off air. So let, 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 me, let me rephrase that. Mad Men, who many of you know is an AMC staple, is going to begin its fifth season, uh, its final season, excuse me, on April 5th. Now, everybody's bummed about it, but what I've noticed is that as a lot of signature shows come to a close, a lot of internet and, you know, Netflix programming is starting to really gain a foothold in the mainstream. I mean, Kevin Spacey winning a Golden Globe for House of Cards is definitely validation enough that Netflix and just the the online medium is definitely viable as a, as a long-term entertainment property. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because right now we're with those shows uh shows like I said Mad Men on the Way Out and shows like, you know, um uh, what you call it? Uh, House of Cards on the Come Up there's there's a lot of properties that are being looked at differently and some are even being considered as exclusives for entities like Netflix or uh, Amazon or any of the other companies. One such is um, a film called Wet Hot Summer. Now, if you guys know this film, the original film was released in 2001, but it took place in the 80s and had a who's who of actors and actresses. Um, well, as it turns out, they're actually going to take that series they're going to take that movie and convert it into a Netflix series with uh, pretty much all the um, the cast members from the original film reprising their roles. Now, this is a who's who of, of actors and actresses, including Elizabeth Banks, Christopher Maloney, Amy Poehler, Paul Rudd, and Bradley Cooper. The series will be eight episodes, um, but as of right now, Netflix is still not 100% confirmed for the order of the series, but still, uh, a property like this, like like, you know, Wet Hot American Summer is a is something that, you know, it's a movie. It came and went. Nobody thought that there would be some sort of a TV series on on the docket. But companies like Netflix come into play and give series like that uh, a second life. I mean, 
fans of Arrested Development were treated to a season courtesy of Netflix, and people were very, very grateful for that. And, you know, there's a lot of shows that get cut off before their prime. And, you know, maybe Netflix and Amazon are solutions for shows like that that get cut off before their prime, that people don't give them enough time to gain any traction. And we kind of sit there, you know, woulda, coulda, shoulda with regards to how, how those shows would have ended if they would have been given an extended run. So there you have it. You know, Mad Men is on its way out beginning April 5th. Uh, Wet Hot American Summer is being turned into a series. And um, Ash and Ver Ash versus Evil Dead with Bruce Campbell, of course, reprising his role of Ash is heading your way on stars. Again, like I said, you have all these properties that are being given a second look because you're creating new areas for them to be seen. So uh, definitely a good time to be a TV fan. Anyway, let me switch gears and jump into the box office totals. It's not a shocker that Taken 3, um, with its unique set of skills, took the number one slot at $40.4 million. Um, a lot of people feels that feel that this was not Liam Neeson's best film, but obviously he still sells tickets at the box office, securing the number one slot. Selma was uh, number two with $11.2 million. Into the Woods was number three. The Hobbit was number four. Unbroken came in at the number five slot. The Imitation Game was number six. A Night at the Museum, Secret of the Tomb was number seven. Annie was number eight. The Woman in Black, Angel of Death dropped to number nine. And The Hunger Games, Mockingjay Part 1 came in at number 10. They have um, officially dropped off Big Hero 6 from the top 10. But um, one film that I am looking forward to seeing is um, American Sniper. I've been hearing really good things about it. I'm going to try and get to the box to the theater to check that out sooner rather than later. I've been hearing good things about Selma. And I think with the Oscar snub that the film had, I'm sure that those box office numbers for that film are going to go up very, very quickly. Um, if you haven't got a chance to check out The Hobbit Battle of the Five Armies, I recommend you do. Um, very solid film. I actually was going to review it, but you know, I lost track of time and I was actually, um, a little late toward to seeing it in theaters. So, um, you're going to have to wait for my Blu-ray review. If you want to hear my take on that film. All right, this is going to blow your minds. A couple of months back, we talked about rumors that there was going to be a sequel to Beetlejuice. Now, originally they were looking to have um, Winona Ryder reprise her role as Lydia Dietz. And of course, um, Michael Keaton reprise his role as the ghost with the most. So talks of the film have, you know, gone up and down, up and down. But it looks like it is going to actually get done. Uh, the Hollywood Reporter spoke with Seth Graham Smith, who wrote the sequel. And um, he said that the story will utilize a less is more approach uh, much like the first film did, where, of course, you didn't see Beetlejuice until the middle part, uh, the middle of the first film. Um, in this case, uh, the film is going to follow Lydia Dietz, who is now obviously an adult and has her own family. And, of course, Beetlejuice is going to wreak havoc on her life once more. You want to know something funny about Beetlejuice? Not only is it one of my favorite movies, but the Beetlejuice cartoon with uh, Jacques the Skeleton and the monster across the street is a cartoon I could never get tired of watching. It was so it was so well written and so over the top that I I never got tired of seeing it. And I remembered there was a uh, Beetlejuice had a nemesis, Germs Pond Scum. He was like uh like a like a fish uh similar to 007 and um just a lot of really great moments in that cartoon and who would have thought that such a dark and crazy film would yield such a crazy cartoon. And not only that, that we would be talking about a, a sequel to that film now in 2015. But yes, it looks like a sequel to Beetlejuice is a go. Once I get more details and a release date, I'll definitely have that ready for you guys. While we are on the subject of sequels, though, I do got to mention that G.I. Joe 3 is a go. And right now, DJ Caruso is the director in line for the third film. Of course, uh, The Rock will be reprising his role uh, as Roadblock, and um, all signs point to other cast members from the other from the second film returning, but it's not 100% confirmed. The only thing that is being said is that Roadblock will have a more prominent role in the film. So, you know, we go from Roadblock being uh, just a jive-talking soul bro in the G.I. Joe cartoons 
to essentially leading the team just because The Rock has incredible screen presence. Take that for what it's worth, but I actually felt that the second G.I. Joe movie was closer in tone to the source material, so it's not all bad. Um, we'll definitely see what happens with that and if DJ Caruso is going to get the nod for that. Switching gears for some small screen news, you guys know, and I've mentioned it on numerous shows, that I really am a, a huge fan of the Hannibal TV series on NBC. I feel that, Mad, that Mads Mikkelsen's performance as Hannibal Lecter is masterful in every sense of the word. He brings a, a, certain, a certain flair, a certain creepiness to the role um, that I haven't seen since the Anthony Hopkins original Silence of the Lambs. So... To hear that this series is starting to pick up once again and just has such an amazing cast, um, you know, I was really excited to hear that they're bringing in the character of Francis Dollarhide. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with the Hannibal Lecter universe, um, one of the books in the series is Red Dragon, which follows a killer uh, called the Tooth Fairy who um, kills, you know, he kills uh, families throughout the film. And in the original uh, film, it was Edward Norton who played the role of Will Graham and Francis Dollar Hyde was played by Ray Fiennes. Now, um, bringing this character to life on the small screen, especially a character that is so visceral and so violent, you know, I was shocked that they were going to do it. But the fact that they cast a very solid actor in Richard Armitage, who many of you know as Thorin Oakenshield or from the original Strike Back TV series in the role of Francis Dollar Hyde is is incredibly interesting. I think that Richard Armitage brings not only, you know, just a, a very, very intense, uh, you know, an intense demeanor to the to the small screen. But he also brings with him just a, a, a more a fan friendly appearance. And when I say that is because uh, Ray Fiennes played a really good Francis Dollarhide. But if you notice in Hannibal, if you watch it on NBC, you notice that each character there. I don't want to say they're they're the beautiful people. But everything about the show is so well done from Hannibal Lecter's impeccable suits to Will Graham's more rustic approach to, um, you know, Lawrence Fishburne's uh, Jack Crawford being a stern presence, but also just a, a very classy actor on screen. I really have high hopes not only for the series as a whole, but for Richard Armitage as Francis Dollarhide. Definitely do yourselves a favor if you haven't checked out the Hannibal TV series and you have a strong stomach definitely check it out it's very good i i i really really recommend it you can probably find the first season on demand on amazon so if you have amazon prime you can watch it there and i believe it's also on netflix so you might be able to find it there as well i definitely recommend it but like i said it definitely is not for the squeamish in some episodes so there you have it uh richard armitage is francis dollarhide and he will be appearing for six episodes in the next season of Hannibal. We got a uh, release date for Ghost in the Shell, which of course last week we were talking about Scarlett Johansson's casting for the film. Uh, you're going to need to mark down April 14th, 2017 to see that on the big screen. Meanwhile, the live action version of The Jungle Book was moved from October 9th, 2015 to October 15th, 2016. So, there you have it. There's also going to be a remake, get this, of Pete's Dragon, which is going to be hitting the big screen August 12th, 2016. All right, so I want to talk about some casting, not really casting news, but more so animated news with regards to the DC line of animated features. Uh, Aquaman and the Throne of Atlantis is the next film from DC, which looks incredibly promising but uh, there's another film that's coming out, which is Batman versus Robin, which is going to borrow elements from the very, very well done Court of Owls Batman series, which means that we're going to see Talon uh, animated in a Batman cartoon. And I'm definitely looking forward to that. Um, even though the film's called Batman versus Robin, it is not a direct adaptation of the Court of Owls, but it's definitely going to borrow elements from that story. So definitely be on the lookout for that. When it, when it arrives on DVD and Blu-ray and video on demand this spring. 
All right, we got one last bit of news to close things out, and I'm shocked that it, it was it it got killed so quickly. Well, not quickly, but just was put to bed sooner rather than later, and that is the Gremlins reboot. A couple of months back, we were discussing that they were planning on rebooting Gremlins and bringing it to the big screen. Well, as it turns out, it looks like that is no longer in the cards. Seth Graham Smith said... Uh, via Entertainment Weekly that the project has run out of steam and that it is no longer moving forward because everybody got busy doing other things. So there you have it. Uh, big screen reboot of Gremlins is not happening. But, um, you know, we will probably see. Uh, and, and this is one of those things that I have a feeling is going to happen. Even though we're not going to see a Gremlins reboot now, it is inevitable. It is inevitable that a Gremlins reboot will happen just because it's such a, 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 a very, very well done franchise that even even the second film was just as good as the first. And some people will debate me on that. But um, I do think that within the next, I, I want to say five years, we will see a Gremlins reboot in some capacity. And honestly, before I see a reboot of Gremlins, can somebody do a reboot of Critters? <laughs> during you know when when during the 80s and 90s after gremlins popularity there were other films that tried to take advantage of the uh you know malicious monster genre there was ghoulies which had the real the bald ghoulie that would come out of the toilet who i really liked um you had munchies which was god awful and then you had the critters which uh, depending on which film you watch some were better than others but the uh, the bounty hunters with no faces was a pretty cool touch, and I always liked that when the bounty hunter the bounty hunters would show up to hunt the critters, they would look at a movie poster or they would look at an attractive woman or an attractive man and take their appearance because obviously that's an easy way to get casting out of the way. Um, I, I'd like to see it like a big screen version of critters done in, a, in you know a light hearted sort of way. I mean. Obviously, in, in we're in an era of PG-13 horror movies, so I think Critters would actually be interesting in seeing on the big screen. Plus, effects are a lot better, so I think the creature effects alone would, we, would be worth seeing. Again, that's wishful thinking on my part. Don't pay me any mind, because it definitely was not one of the greatest movies ever. Just a movie that, has, that I have a soft spot for. Anyway, that's going to actually wrap up this week's show, so let's get the hell out of here, shall we? You've just heard My Take Radio episode 246, the gaming and entertainment edition. Um, as always, you can listen to live episodes of My Take Radio every Wednesday at 11 p.m. Eastern for MMA and wrestling or every Thursday at 11 p.m. Eastern for gaming and entertainment. As always, you can get the latest and greatest with regards to My Take Radio either via iTunes, Stitcher, or TuneIn Radio. If you want to watch video versions of the show, head over to YouTube and you can find them either on our RageWorks YouTube channel. It's youtube.com forward slash official RageWorks or youtube.com forward slash my take radio. Uh, you can find us on social media. You can find the show on Twitter at my take radio. You can find RageWorks at rage underscore works. Of course, you can find my take radio and RageWorks on Facebook, Google Plus and Pinterest as well. If you're into Instagram and you want to see all my crazy pictures, definitely you can follow RageWorks underscore Rich on Instagram for the time being until I figure out a way to manage two accounts on Instagram without trying to rip my hair out. Until then, that's going to be the only Instagram account on record for both My Take Radio and RageWorks. All right, let's get the hell out of here. As always, on behalf of myself, Slick, and the rest of the RageWorks My Take Radio family, Thank you guys for tuning in. I will see you guys next week. Peace. I'm rich, bitch. That's all, folks.